morning, Ty. Morning, Josh. Morning. Yep. How are your weekends? Good. Went four wheeling for a couple days and just hung out. Fun. Where'd you go? So went over <clears throat> went over by uh, Pocatello. There's a little mountain range over there that we went to. Cool. Is that a place you guys go a lot? No, it, it was actually our first time going. Okay. That specific trail, but it was fun. Do you camp there when you go, or? Um, we've we've actually had a reunion up there, close to where we went, but yeah. Okay. Fun. How about Josh? Did you do anything? Nope. <laughs> do you uh, want fireworks? What's that? Uh, everything's either closed or overcrowded, so. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Did you see any fireworks outside your window? Uh, I saw a bunch of people illegally shoot them off outside my window. Because uh -huh. fireworks are illegal in my state, but people do it anyway. Oh, I didn't know they were completely illegal. Wow. I mean, they're not illegal in Idaho. They're illegal in Colorado. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, huh. Wow. Yeah, I thought with Utah how often they have these huge fires. It's every single year in July. Every single year without fail. And I've really thought strongly that they should just ban fireworks because there's so many fires and it's not worth it to me. I know fireworks are cool, but endangering thousands of people's property and lives for the sake of some lights in the sky, you could still have a commercial license and have somebody go do a big show and that would be fine, I think. But I think all these people doing it doing fireworks illegally in places they shouldn't. I guess changing the law wouldn't matter then, right? Because they're yeah. not obeying the law anyway. Yep. Laps in Wyoming where all the illegal fireworks in most of these states come from. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tough, tough problem to solve, I guess. Um. Hey guys, hi Zibia, hi Christian, hi Austin. Hello. Hey Robert, hey Gunther. Robert's watching cartoons, I can tell. That's my kid's I know. toy. Oh, is it? They're singing. Yeah. I just had to give you a hard time, Robert. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. oh, I can't tell you how often I watch PJ Masks when I'm in class. <laughs> it's Mr. Chick-fil-A. Hey, Josh. Well, not anymore. <laughs> how are you? Oh, really? Oh no, is this good or bad? <laughs> no, it's why I was gone last week. I was training my replacement. So. Oh, wow. Man. How are you so, guys? <laughs> we're doing good. We were just sharing our weekend stuff everybody did. So did you do anything fun or did you work? Uh, just lots of work. <laughs> so you're you're done working there now, huh? Yeah, um, I, I got a job working at a, like a cabinet making place. <laughs> huh? And they needed me to stay a little longer and train my replacement. So last week I was doing two. Oh, doing wow. <laughs> okay. So sorry yeah. to miss so much. No, I, uh, I knew you had a good reason you told me. So <laughs> I hope your cabinet job is, 
it's a good move for you. It sounds like it is. So thanks. I hope so too. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, my son did that for a while. Um, and he liked it a lot. So the well, place good. he was working at was really, really, really small. And so they ended up closing their doors, but he loved it. So yeah, this is just a temporary thing. I'm probably just gonna do it for the summer. Yeah. Well, it, I've heard it's in demand. There's a lot of need for it. Well, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, the place he was at, it wasn't that they weren't in demand. It was just a weird thing about their business that they weren't they weren't doing things right financially. So they ended up closing, even though their oh. customers could have still used their products. So. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, that happens a lot in businesses seems like yeah so good to see you though yeah thanks i'm glad to be back glad to have a normal schedule again yeah i bet well i know we're a few minutes after start time um let's do an opening prayer do we have a volunteer I can say it. Thank you. Dear Holy Father, we're grateful for the opportunity that we have to gather together and be able to learn more about this field. When I ask thee to please help us that we can have the spirit with us, that we can always apply these things and be able to help our classmates and other people. And help us that we can always be healthy in these times and that we can always be a good example for others. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Christian. Uh, who has the fear fighting thought today? So someone who's here? Yeah, I got it. Great. So I, uh, I found this quote in um, one of my personal studies. And um, this is by um, President Packer. Uh, he said, um, we live in troubled times, very troubled times. We hope, we pray for better days. But that is not to be. The prophecies t tell us that um, we, we will not as a people, as families, or as individuals be exempt from the trials to come. No one will be spared the trials common to home and family, work, disappointment, grief, health, aging, ultimately death. But, but then he goes on to say, we need, we need not live in fear of the future. We have every reason to rejoice and little reason to fear. If we, follow, if we follow the promptings of the Spirit, we, we will be safe. Whatever the future holds, we will be shown what to do. And I like that last part where it, it talks about following the promptings of the Spirit. Um, I think it's important that we, um, we remain close to the Spirit so that we can have that peace and that, uh, that guidance and that comfort in our lives. And as we put our focus on Christ we can have that um, assurance of better days for the future. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ty. That's a good one. Well, I want to share with you guys something today. So we've been talking a lot about a concept in class called images. And I thought it might be helpful if we went over that today. How many of you have ever used a 3D printer? Could you raise your hand if you've ever used a 3D printer? Sorry, can you do it one more time if your hand was up before? Hi, Josh and Josh. Great. Um, Josh Elliott, can you explain to us 
if you want to print something, if you want to print something on your printer, what are the steps really high level that a person has to do to print something on a 3D printer? Well, first off, you need to either make or find a blueprint for something, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You need to convert it into a file that's compatible with the 3D printer and, I don't know, uh, give it to the 3D printer and print it off, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, good. Those Not exactly are... the most technical way of saying it, but... Yeah. No, that's correct. So um, the first step that Josh Elliott mentioned, let's see if I can share this, was to find a, was to find a blueprint of what you want to print, right? So what you do, so this is, a, this is a software application called Cura. It's called a slicer. And what a slicer does is you take and find a file on the internet or from a buddy of yours that's a designer. Um, and then you, you have to open it in this tool called a slicer. And so this is an example of a uh, a part that I printed and my friend just emailed me the file. So the file that I open up, it's just a diagram um, that you can spin around and examine and, you know, look at, Let's see if I can get it to, I'm really bad at using this software, but this is the basic idea and so Josh, I've got this, Josh Elliott, I've got this part here, but I can only see it on my screen. And I want to see this part in front of me, right? So what do I do next? You told me the steps, but can you remind me? What's the next thing I need to do? You convert it into a way that the 3D printer can understand it. Good. So how would I do that on this screen? Do you have any ideas? Can you see what I need to do here? Uh, press the slice button. Absolutely. Uh, why is it called slice? Does anyone know why it's called slice? So the way a 3D printer works is it applies plastic in layers. Okay. It has a nozzle that squirts liquid plastic onto a, a, what they call a bed. And it has to squirt one layer at a time. Okay. So if you take a three-dimensional object and you want to squirt it down in layers, you have to slice it for the machine to know what to do at each different layer. So we're creating machine instructions that are called G-code. Um, and the G code is actually, it's X, Y, Z coordinates. So it tells it start at this point and then follow a path this direction for this many millimeters and then stop and then go up again and go to this point, which is slightly higher and go this many millimeters and then stop. That's what we're doing when we're slicing is we're creating those instructions and those X, Y, Z coordinates. So I'm going to click slice. And it's creating those paths, those path instructions in G code right now. So when it's done, we go to a, uh, oops. We go to the printer, and I've got one right here. And let's see if we can do this. Switch. Switch my, can you guys see my printer? No, you're seeing me, darn it switch that. 
Are you guys seeing my printer now? I think so. Uh, yeah. Nope. Okay, I'm gonna stop this share. And you should see one of the many pictures out there. Um, where is it? Okay, yeah, so there's my printer. Do you guys see that? On yeah, one, I, see it. I yeah. joined with my phone, so it's not where I am, it's a, another box. So that's my printer. So what I do is if I want to print something, I go to this menu here and on the menu, I say print from a TF, which is, I don't even know what that stands for, but it's a flash drive that I put the G code on. And so here's like a box that I want to print, right? Let me scoop this printer back. I have to do this before I print stuff. And then I've got a set. I'm actually going to go back to home. Main. And then I go prepare. Auto home. So this sets the, uh, the print nozzle so that it goes right to the XYZ home of 000. zero, zero. So it's going down. Now it's right at the origin. And we'll see how well it does today. It looks like it's a little off. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move the axis, move the Z up, move it by one millimeter. So it's not gonna run into the bed. I think that's about right. Then I'm going to go up again, prepare, print from TF, and uh, see I wanted to print a fox. So there's a, there's a fox here. Well actually, yeah, let's do the fox. So it says bed heating, and what's going to happen is it's going to take a minute to heat up the plastic nozzle that squirts out the plastic, and then when it does, it'll start uh, moving around and laying down some red plastic. You can see it on a spool here, and it's pulling the plastic from that spool as kind of like a thread material. And then it's, it inserts it into this sleeve that you can see kind of like a little tube. And then it comes out this nozzle when it's heated the right way. And it applies it onto this bed. You can see these red lines. So at the end, um, I think it might be easier if I switch, but here's the actual model that we looked at before and it's been printed. So it, it did it really well. Uh, it looked, took a little trial and error, but there it is exactly how it was on the screen. And uh, I'm just set that down. So what I was thinking about today is the comparison between that and uh, an image for a computer and how we get from the original file to something that is what we want it to be and the steps and how they're kind of similar to when we do 3D printing. Um, so when we build an image in Docker or another kind of computer image, we similarly start with a file that represents some things that we as humans understand. So if you look at this diagram, uh, let me make it a little larger. If you look at this diagram, we start off over here where, can you guys read that? What's inside of that little box that I circled? Okay. So somebody who's been quiet so far today, can you read that for me, what's in it? 
in the file. Out loud. Uh, from nginx copy index.html expose 80. Thank you. Or 80. Thanks, Josh Rattel. Okay, good. So we can read that, right? All of us were able to read it. We understood the words Josh said because they're they're English. Those are English words that we speak, okay? We're humans and that's the language that we speak, right? So computers don't speak English, believe it or not. Uh, we've, we've ma manipulated computers in order to make it so they act like they speak English, but they actually do not. So in order for the computers to cooperate with us, we actually have to take what we understand and transform it into something that they understand. That way they can execute the instructions that we want them to. Kind of like the printer's doing right now. We want, we want the computers to be able to execute the instructions that we're giving them and follow exactly what we want them to do. And if we don't have a way of communicating that with them in their own language, then it will not effectively follow the instructions that we're trying to give it. So you can kind of see this example. Um, it's tracing a path that was told to it. And does anyone remember the language we used to talk to a 3D printer that we talked about a little bit earlier? What's it called? It's called G-code. So G-code is the path and the coordinates that collectively instruct a 3D printer how to, how to do what it's supposed to do for a specific drawing. So if we look at this diagram here, we have a file that we understand as humans, which is kind of like our drawing. It's kind of like the drawing that we all looked at at the beginning where we were able to see exactly what something, what the computer was gonna make into a G-code file. So, we look at this Docker file, how would we get from this Docker file that we all can read and understand in English, how would we get that into an image that, uh, a Docker runtime could understand. What's this? What's the command that we run? Pause that. Print. It's kind of loud. What was, the, what was the question again, Brother Medad? My question is, Andrew, we speak English. We understand the words that, that are in this file. This is human readable, okay? So to get to a machine readable Docker image, how do we, how do we convert this Docker file that's human readable to a Docker image that's only machine readable? How do we do that? you build it or compile it? Yeah, you build it. That's right. So we would stop annotating. Okay. Well, this doesn't have the command, does it? So let's go over here. So if I'm at a command line, Okay, so if I'm at a command line, annotating there. If I'm at a command line and I've got a bunch of projects and I go to this project, nothing there. How about Kubernetes? There we go. If I go to this Docker test, 
And there's no Docker file. Okay, well, we'll make one. So I'm going to just do nano, which is an editor. It's a line editor that we use in the Linux command line. Nano Docker file. And I'm going to say from Nginx. We can all read that. That's English. Okay, I'm going to write it out by doing control O. That's the command that writes the file out. It's going to prompt me what the file name is, Docker file. So if I hit enter, it just takes that. Okay, it wrote two lines. So now if I do control X, which is how I exit, ls, I've got a file called Docker file. So what's the command now? I've got this human readable file. What is it again? Docker what? Build. Build. Good job. And now how do I tell it what to build? Because there could be a thousand files all over my computer, right? A thousand Docker files if I'm a super geek, or maybe even just two. Two would be enough that it would be hard to know which one. So how do I tell it which one to do? want it to know the Docker file specifically that I'm looking for. So there's two ways you can do it. One way is you get in the folder that you want it to build. Were you going to say something, Ty? Sorry if I interrupted you. Uh, I was going to say that too, that just if you're in the specific directory with the Docker file, you can just do uh, um, Docker build and then Docker file. Okay this um, context must be a directory mm, we're close we're really close so we know this is the right start and Linux how do I tell it current directory what's the what's the syntax for current directory CPWD. okay that oh, is a command that'll tell me right the working directory right yeah, so how do I tell, how do I indicate on the command line a path that the path means current directory, if I tell it that? Just a single dot? Yes, that's correct. So what does this single dot mean, guys? Uh, is it the one that, no, this is the one you said uh, going one upwards, like the directory? That's this. Uh, oh, that's a that, that's a two dots. Okay. Uh, or dot dot slash rather. So dot dot slash would be the directory above where I am. Okay. And dot is Ty just told us if you were listening. Current directory. Current directory. Nice job, Weston. Okay, so if I say Docker build dot. I'm starting to speak computer lingo, right? Because this isn't how we talk to each other, is it? <laughs> I don't say, um, we're going to have dinner dot, right? I don't say that. So, so what if we were to say CD Docker file, like we go into the directory, would that work still? CD Docker file, like yeah. this? Yeah. Oh, OK. But if I do LS, I do see there's a Docker file here. So why did it say I couldn't CD to it, Andrew? Uh, is it because it's a file? Yeah. Yeah. It is. So Docker's kind of weird where it, it just, it doesn't want you to tell it necessarily where the file is. It'll just say, hey, here's the folder that I'm in. I'll find the Docker file. There's going to be only one of them. So you just say, you just say docker build and you say right here right here's where i want you to build now go find the file it's right there so that's what dot means is right here basically so if i say that what's it doing now it's 
You guys see that? It's speaking kind of English to us, right? What did it say? Sending build context to Docker daemon. So if you look at, there's a thing called the Docker D um, process that's running. It's right here. So this is a background process that's running on my machine that I'm working on. And what happened when I said Docker build is we actually sent a command to that background process. And the background process was looking for a folder. So we told it, this gave it the name of the folder to build within. So, this, is a, this is a quick question because we had, uh, we had to app YAML and Docker file. So you don't need to specify which file it should go to. That's a very good question. So we have both files here. We have an app YAML and a Docker file, both. Yeah. Which one does the Docker daemon look for? Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Could that be the reason why you, you started with Docker build? Mm hmm Okay. Yes. So I'm the app YAML is specifically Kubernetes. Okay. And then the Docker build doesn't have anything to do with Kubernetes yet. It's just building a doc a generic Docker image from a generic Docker file. And there's lots of ways of running Docker. You can run Docker locally without Kubernetes. You can run it on uh, Docker. Uh, Swarm. You can run it in Fargate. You can run it in Kubernetes. You can run it in Cloud Foundry. So Kubernetes is like one of a million different platforms you can run Docker on. Good question, Andrew. Well, so now if I say Docker images, ls, I have nothing. Why? Did it finish? It said it did, docker images. There we go, sorry. I did the command wrong. So I just have this from Nginx, right? That's all I have. Um, so that's the image that I just pulled. Now what's funny is it says three weeks ago. So I don't know if that three weeks ago is because the image I have is coming from somewhere else that's three, three weeks old, or if I did this three weeks ago, I don't remember. But now we have the machine readable image that will do the commands we want it to do, don't we? Because if we go back to our diagram, we started off, with a human readable file. Oops. Human readable file. But now we have the machine readable one, right? Which is called what in Docker? What's the machine readable file called? Human readable, machine readable, and it is called a the machine readable one, the Docker image. Yes, Robert. And then the humans, the Docker file. Yes. Good. That is right. Good job. Great. Well, this concept, believe it or not, goes way further, way, way further than just Docker. So in case you wonder why on earth are we focusing so much on images and all of this stuff, there is a reason. And I was going to say, 
I think we skipped a couple concepts in this class that would be really helpful to go over. So let's take a step back for a minute. We've talked a lot about servers in this class, but we've never really talked about what a server even is. What is a server? Is it like when you go to Olive Garden and somebody brings you cheesecake? It's something, it's a machine that provides a service. Very good, Chris. That's right. So, uh, what's a computer? Ever thought about that? It works with numbers and stuff. <laughs> no? <laughs> Andrew, you don't agree? It does work with numbers. But we yeah. use it for a lot more, right? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. not wrong. It's just not right. <laughs> well, computers. I don't know. Would you, you, yeah. What would you, would you say is an electronic device that is used for storing and processing data? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good definition. So, what's the difference then between a computer and a server? Is there a difference? Well, a computer is like a uh, electronic device that people use kind of to fulfill their tasks mm -hmm. or to accomplish their yeah tasks, I guess. And while a server is pretty much a, it's the same like a computer, but actually does not provide service to people, but um, um, pretty much provides service or kind of like maintain or offer service to computers. Very good. That's correct. So the customer of a computer is what? What is the customer of a computer? A person. A person. And what is the customer of a server? It's a computer. Another computer. That's right. Very good. I like that description. So if we were to look at a browser, um, Let's talk about that for a second. Oh, I got my diagrams a little off here. Where did this go? Yeah, oh, okay, we're good. So where where would I install a browser? Would I install it on a server or a computer? Which one? Well, normally you do install it on the computer, but the browser and the servers as well, they have also browsers because you know you need to install things on a server. So sometimes we install it for convenience, but does a server need a browser? No. Yeah, you're right. Sometimes you'll put one on there. What about Nginx? Would I install Nginx on a server or a browser? What is Nginx? Server. Okay, good. Thanks, Chris. And this is the fun part. So if I've got a server running Nginx and a computer running browser, we can see what Besmer was describing, which is that the computer is the customer of the server. But as Chris mentioned, a server isn't a server unless it offers services. So you can have a server out there that's running nothing and it's really pointless. There's no point. So I've got, let's imagine that I've got a computer running, I've got a server running, and I shut down the computer. What's the impact? The computer just isn't going to get any services from the server? That's correct. And how many people would it impact usually? One or two. Right, the users of that computer, right? Let's flop things around. So I flip the computer back on, okay? Now I shut down the server. What's the impact? Anybody who wants that service can't get it. Anybody, anybody, no one can get to it, right? 
how many users would be, what numbers would we be talking about? How many people could it affect if a server's down? So it can be from thousand to millions or hundred millions. Yes. Can you think of an example where well, this the church website? I think the church website is visited by like millions of people a week. Yes, that is correct. Good. Okay. So what's the difference? Someone who hasn't uh, shared yet today their thoughts. What have you learned about the difference between a computer and a server? How about Austin? Uh, what was the question? What's the difference between a computer and a server? Um, I mean, from what I know is, uh, I mean, they're both technically computers. <laughs> That's right. They are both technically computers. As is the server has a bit more of a specific function over than just a computer. Yes, that is correct. So the function is what differentiates a computer from a server. So could I take my laptop and make it into a server? You could, it probably wouldn't be very powerful or effective. Okay, what if I got a really good laptop? Then it'll be a better server. Okay, good. Would it be wise for me to run my laptop as a server? No. Why not? Um, from what I understand, I think servers, they tend to be very, uh, very beefy computers. Okay, good. So they're, they're known for their reliability, right? Servers? They should be. The hardware used for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's the goal, is to make them reliable enough. <laughs> right, good. So what, other, what about if I bought one of those and I um, went? Yeah, go ahead. So I think well, you want to be scalable as well. If you have, like, I don't know, a company that let's suppose that I don't know plays music okay so many people come and visit your website and listen music to your web to your website right and then you have like 1,000 people initially and then but you are doing a really good job you have very quality high quality music so like a million people come and listen to your music right and then your so you have a laptop which initially can support your traffic but later on you want to have, be scalable. So if you have a computer, you can add more RAM, you can add more hard drive, you can put more fan because it's gonna, you know, the more it's gonna work, it's gonna get more hot. So you need like bigger fans. But if you have a, a computer, you can add those so you can make it more scalable. But if you have a laptop, it's like you're very limited to almost like you cannot do anything to it, it's scalable. It, it's a closed, architecture, right? A laptop, mm -hmm. you can't really expand it by adding more drives and you could in some computer, some laptops, very few, there's an extra um, compartment Slot. under to add a secondary drive. Yeah, and then there's, uh, there's usually two slots for memory. So you could add another stick of memory. But I, yeah, that's right. They're not as expandable. Well, what if I got a really good server and the fanciest kind you can get and I went into my basement and plugged it in in my food storage room, put it on a shelf and then opened up for, for traffic. So Besmer made a really good um, observation about a music streaming company. So say I used this server in my food storage room and I've got lots of people downloading I, M, uh, MP3s, and then I've got lots of people streaming music. It's gonna be the next Spotify, I know it. So what's gonna be my problem? What am I gonna run into? I've got plenty of money, I don't really, but in this scenario, and I can buy as many servers as I want because it's so popular. I'm gonna put them all in my food storage room. Any problems with that? You need to AC that thing up. Say again? 
need to put a bunch of AC units in there just to keep it cool. That's right. Because uh, servers run hot no matter what they're doing. Good. Yes, that's right. They're all they're always running and they're always hot. And then if you run more CPU, right? The more CPU you're running, then the hotter they get, and the more exhaust that heat sink pulls off of that CPU and pushes that hot air out into my um, into my food storage room. So what if the door's shut and there's no AC? I've got a hundred servers in there. What's going to happen? Something's going to fry. You're going to lose a lot of money. You'll lose a lot of money. You'll see the smoke coming out of your roof. Yeah. CPUs do not like being hot. Even though they get really hot, they don't like it, do they? Yeah. So, they, I mean, your machine can't tolerate too much heat or it'll start to melt. Good. Okay. So I've got problems with cooling. Any other problems I'm going to have with 100 servers in my food storage room? Well, I would think that you probably want to kind of like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you want to kind of a backup. So like the companies, even like uh, database companies, like I guess even like Facebook, you know, they have so many databases around the world. Even the church does the same. So they have databases in even different like states or even countries. So one of those is down, then they have like a backup. So I think with the servers is the same. If your servers at, at home is like down because the electricity or the internet connection or like I don't know, yeah, there is something going on in your house that that server cannot be up, then you have like another server that just come right back on and kind of to pick up the work. So site redundancy is what you're suggesting. Right. Having redundant sites, so we have one location in Las Vegas, one in Denver. And if Denver has an earthquake, um, then Las Vegas probably won't have one at the exact same time. Right. Great. Site redundancy is really, really cool thing. Good. You mentioned electricity. Um, yeah, if I've got a power outage, which I have them about once a month, mm -hmm. and as uh, we go back to the scenario, right, the server's down, absolutely down, unless I have what? Uh, UPS. Good. What does that stand for? Uninterrupted power supply. That's what I use on my computer right now. Oh, great. And why do you use that, Austin? Um, precaution. Yeah. Cool. So if the power goes out in your apartment, what happens with your, what does your UPS do for you? It gives me about two to three minutes of, uh, Electricity, just enough time to safely shut down the computer, save all my files. Great. Good. And they make UPSs that are as are big enough to support uh, several racks of servers. So they make the same kind of thing Austin has for one computer. They make giant ones. And so if the power goes out, they have a battery inside them. Yours has a battery, I imagine. And that's how it does it. Good. So it's a power strip about this big and that thick. Cool. It weighs, it weighs a ton. It cost me like $80. It was the most expensive power strip I ever bought. Yeah, but definitely a good investment. Uh, a lot of things can mess up your computer if it's doing the wrong thing when the power goes down. Cool. Well, there's one other thing we haven't considered. So we've talked about heating or cooling rather. We've talked about um, expandability, site redundancy. We've talked about power. Um, Besmer hinted on the last, there's one other big factor we're gonna run into if I get super popular on my uh, streaming site. Bandwidth? Absolutely. Good. I was gonna say security. Yeah, okay. I would agree with that too, both of those. So I'm not gonna have a big enough pipe and my house to support uh, a million users. And the other thing, yeah, is my home network is probably not the best network for this setup. So great. Well, I just thought that might help. Um, there's one other thing that we should talk about that we've discussed in this class indirectly several times. And I thought we ought to go through it for a minute. Let's see if I can. Let's do this. Get all these. 
what is a dumb terminal? Anybody heard of that before? Anybody heard of a dumb terminal? No. Um, how about a uh, trying to think? Anybody ever, ever done soldering with wires? Oh yeah. Okay, cool. So back in the day, if you wanted to add a computer, it's not really a computer, okay? So what what we're seeing here, oops, uh, if I can do this right, off the mouse, I want to draw. I always forget how to get off of that. There we go. So what we're looking at here are not computers, believe it or not. They're like TVs. Anyone ever had a TV before? Okay, like the old kind with the antenna on it. That's what these are, these are TVs. So dumb terminals, all they could do, they're dumb because they don't have any processing inside of them at all. It's just like an old TV. It's just a screen that shows you information on it. And what you do is solder a wire to the back of it, that dumb terminal, and you'd solder another wire to the back of, they call it a mini. The reason this is called a mini is because it's smaller than a food storage room. It's a, it's a server, quote unquote, that is smaller than a food storage room because the original computers took up probably my garage size. And so mini, a mini back in the day, they called them mini computers or minis, which is so ironic because they were literally the size of a refrigerator and they call them a mini. They were between the size of a refrigerator and probably, uh, I don't know what else, but it, they, were, they were big enough to fit in your bedroom, a mini was. So that was what they ran on and they had these dumb terminals. Well, when you, if you look at one of these screens, let's see how close that, if you look at one of these screens up close, Let's zoom in if we can. Okay, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be Jane. What do I have to do to log in as Jane? It looks like there's three things she had to type. What was the first one? Just uh, go to port five and then put in her username and her password. Yeah, port five. Well, that's interesting. What does port five mean? I guess that's just like maybe the location where all her info is stored. Very yep. close, very close. So if you look at the, um, if you look at the mini on the right, do you see that there's a line going between her terminal and number five on the right, right here? That is the actual soldered connection that her terminal is connected to. And so what would happen is she'd get a job at a desk just like any other person. The guy would come in, set up this TV looking thing in front of her with a keyboard and the keyboard and the TV are both soldered onto a wire that goes into the back of this mini. And the guy, the technician is going to give her a piece of paper and write down on it, your port five. Just remember that, Jane. Okay. So the guy sitting next to her says, oh, you got it all set up. Go log in. You got to get that piece of paper out. Okay. Now type in five. And so why would we need to do that? Otherwise, she might be talking to 13, right? She, she could get the data that, that was meant for Tom, her neighbor. <laughs> so if, if she typed in 13 and Tom was on 13, it would say, uh -uh, uh -uh. we can't have two guys on 13. We can only have one on 13. Right here, there's one wire that goes from 13 to Tom, and that's it. 
you're on five, Jane. You're you're the only one allowed on five, and you've got one wire that goes between you and the mini computer. So you got to stay on port five so that all your traffic is specific to your connection. So these numbers became a way, these port numbers of identifying users and their connections to the servers. So now let's go into the future. Let's talk about how it works now. Zoom back out again. Okay, so Jane is now 65 years old and she is working at a modern call center and she sits down, she's got a computer and how do we uniquely identify that computer on the server? How do we know it's her? IP address? Yeah, at least that's how we know it's her computer, I should say. We don't necessarily know it's Jane, but we do know it's her computer based on this IP address. Okay. How many IP addresses could I have on this, uh, on this diagram? So there's a server here, and it has 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20 ports. These are 20, 20 network ports, the same number as we saw of uh, soldered ports, but there's 20 of these. And then this is a network switch, which also has 20 ports, okay? Um, how many IPs though uh, could this switch in theory support? It, what's the ballpark number? More or less than 20, what do you think? More. Definitely more. Definitely more. Yeah, definitely more than 20 IP addresses. So we're not limited to the number of ports now. That changes the game considerably. Uh, the number of ports has very little to do with the addressing of the terminals. The terminal address now is a abstract concept that is not directly tied to the physical layer. So we're in a whole different era now. However, let's do something here. So if I were to run Nginx on the server, and I were to say, let's run it on port 443 over here. How many users could talk to Nginx on port 443? What's the limit? And what is the port 443? What does that even mean? 443, is it a uh, HTTP? -S? Yes, yes, it is. That's what it is, it's HTTPS. So, so instead of ports meaning a specific user now, it actually is used for a specific kind of network traffic or a specific kind of application. So these ports now, you can still only have one port 443 running on your server. Just like in Jane's time, there was only one port 5, there was only one Jane, there was only one Tom. But now these ports, instead of representing users, they represent a service that's running on the server. And there can only be one of each one. So if I want to talk to Nginx, it's kind of flipped things around. So instead of Nginx as a user over here on a terminal, Nginx is a service over here on the server. And if I want to talk to Nginx, just think of it like a person, just like Jane has port number five, right? Uh, close that. Well, if the computer wanted to talk to Jane, it had to send traffic on port five before. Well, if I want to talk to Nginx, I have to talk on port 443. And just a quick question on that one. That means uh, port 443 can handle more than one traffic at a time, right? Compared Absolutely. to the dumb. Okay. Yeah, 
it can absolutely handle more than one connection at a time. Absolutely. Yes. The numbering convention is kind of like a carryover from the old days, but it, it's used now to segregate applications instead of segregating users. So it's kind of flipped things around the other way. So you could have um, you could have a, another kind of server or another kind of service running. What's something else you might run on a server other than a web server? What else could I run on it? What about a database? Do those run on servers? So what port would a database run on? How about SQL Server? That one runs on port 1433. So if I wanted to talk to this same server, I could choose. If I want to talk to the database, then this computer over here would need to say, hey, I'm sending this packet to 10.1.1.12 on port 1433. And the server is going to get that request. Oops, I'll learn how to draw eventually. The server is going to get that request. And it's going to say, oh, 1433. We know this port is for this application. And it's going to forward that to the application layer for the database on 1433. And then if the same server said, hey, I've, I've got to pull up your website. Uh, I think it's on 443. Can you show me that? And it would do what? Can someone else draw it? What would the request for 443 look like? How would it get to the right place? Oh, you mean in like the actual details behind the connection? Like ACK, SYNAC, whatever it is, the, no, SYNAC, sure. ACK. Yeah, you could tell us that part if you want, or you can draw it, or both. Well, it's a, I mean, this is for 443, right? So it's, yeah. yeah, so it's, typically it's a TCP connection, which means it's gonna send out a, C, a SYN, um, signaling for a connection, the server respond with the send act saying, I got your message and I acknowledge it. Um, and then the computer will reply with, okay, I acknowledge that I got your reply. And then it sends a get request um, since it's HTTPS requesting a page. And if it's an existing page, the server will apply with the 200 OK and the payload of the page. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. So there was a couple different layers in there that Chris went over. Um, and we're about done with class. But the layers that he talked about were TCP, right? We've got TCP IP running all of our traffic here on this diagram. And then a layer on top of that is HTTP. So HTTP runs over TCP IP and it's a, it's a higher level protocol. It's an application level protocol, okay? But underneath it, everything is executed as packets. And packets are completely lower level than the web requests that we were talking about. Just like, so when he said SYNAC, that's the language of TCP IP. SYN goes to the server, ACK comes back from the server. Now we know we've got a connection. Now we can talk HTTP, and I'm gonna send a GET to the server. I'm going to get a 200 back from the server. Cool. Thanks, guys. Have a good day.
Thank you, Brother Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great day. Oh, I had a quick question. Sure. So I saw that um, the comment, you said that I can still do like the pod squad. Yeah. What happened was that I kind of forgot about it and then I saw it was past due. It was like, oh, so that's why, eh, eh. Oh, So that's why I didn't do it. But you said I can do it, which that's cool, except uh, I meant to email you this earlier, but it was the 4th of July weekend. But <laughs> it won't let me, it, it's closed. Oh, there you go, fix that. I try and leave them open, but sometimes I accidentally set a uh, end date on the visibility. Mm -hmm. Let's fix that here. Assignments. There it is. Closed. And yeah, I did it. That okay, can you check if it's letting you take it now? Uh, yeah. Yep, it says I can submit. Okay. Perfect. And then from what I understand, going over this pod squad real quick, basically I, I just kind of follow the steps and then tells me what to do from there. <laughs> yeah, it's all step by step. You're just adding more pods and then taking that pod back down again. Okay. I should have that done by today then. Okay. Thanks, Austin. Have a good day. Yep. You as well. Okay, thanks. Bye.